Welcome to Unlock the Code, the ultimate autism podcast. We help you unlock the mysteries of autism so your child can be successful in all areas of his life. With your host, the internationally acclaimed author, speaker, and autism and behavior expert, the CEO of Hope Education Services, Jessica Likewise. Well, hello, everyone. My name is Jessica Likewise, and I'm the host of this podcast, Unlock the Code. Thank you so much for taking time in your busy schedules to listen today. We really appreciate you. Tonight, I'm really excited to bring a guest on the podcast who is a martial artist. This person is super, super passionate about martial arts. I've had several friends of mine and to have kids on the spectrum, several clients I worked with, who have told me time and time again that martial arts can be really, really beneficial for children who are on the spectrum, children with special needs, and really children in, in general to the discipline that you know they get from that, from the, the practice, the, the social skills, the following instruction skills. It can really make a big difference in a child's life. And so when I found out this person specializes in working with children with autism and working with children with special needs, I knew I had to bring her on the call. This person began their martial arts training in 1995, so they have lots and lots of experience. In 1999, she began teaching karate and found that it was her passion, and she loved it. She really was passionate about helping kids. She mentored under Mr. Steve Daly, the executive director of the National Child Safety Organization. She came to understand that through the eyes of a child, and today she would refer to that as an inside-out teaching philosophy. Excuse me. So she, that's her philosophy of teaching through the eyes of a child. She currently practices in Casco, Maine at the Bushido Karate Dojo. She's joined by her husband, Eric, her daughter, Jordan, and her son, Nick, in training. And they help over 200 years annually. So definitely a true family business. She is a business owner, a teacher, a dog lover, just like myself. And if you listen to my podcast, you know that I try to get my dog Lucky to be quiet, but he often winds up shaking his ears just as I'm about to talk. So you always, almost always hear him in the background. So I'm a dog lover myself. And she also wrote a book, Get Up, Universal Lessons of Martial Arts, which she will talk a little bit about on the show. So it is a privilege, it's an honor to welcome Lisa McGuire on the show today. Welcome, Lisa. Thanks so much for having me. It's such a pleasure. No, it was, it's my pleasure. So I wanted to you know, start right into this. How did you wind up working with kids with autism when you decided and you started off doing karate? What made you want to work with kids with autism? Um, you know, sometimes you get the things that you want uh, by asking for things that, you know, you get things you don't expect, I guess I should say, by asking for things you want. And my only goal uh, at the time when I started teaching was just to do more karate. I loved it. I wanted to move. And I told my instructor, I said, Sensei, I would like to do, you know, 10 to 15 hours of training a week. And in my mind, I thought that meant I would be, you know, doing personal practice time. And within about two weeks, she had me, um, you know, assisting and helping with, uh, you know, five or six kids' karate classes. And I was so bad at it. Oh, my gosh, I was so horrible at teaching. I thought that teaching meant let's scare children, uh, let's make them think I'm in charge, which you never really do, uh, and let's punish them when they do things wrong. So, I mean, I couldn't be... I couldn't have been worse, I think, when I started. And over time, I realized that my tactics just weren't working. Um, And so I started reading books, and I started, you know, reflecting. And one of the things that my instructor said to me, she said, had some great advice way in the beginning. And she said, you know, first of all, if your classroom is chaotic, it's a reflection of you. And I thought, Oh, so my brain being chaotic is why they're all being crazy. It's not, it's not them. And, uh, and I really, I think I took that to heart. And uh, so I started maybe changing the way that I was teaching. But I knew I loved the kids. I knew I loved martial arts. And I knew I loved sharing it. And so bit by bit, you know, I got better at it. I made tons and tons of mistakes. And, um, and then just tried to make incremental change every year. And uh, now I tell my leadership uh, students, you know, we have curriculum and we have methodologies in the way that we teach karate, which I for sure didn't have back then. Uh, But, 
you know, we've come a long way. We, um, my husband and I purchased the dojo from my instructors in 2004. So we've owned and operated BKD for 14 years now. And uh, we've raised a family here, and we've taught thousands of students. And I think your original question asked, you know, how did I get to teach kids with autism and or kids on different spectrums? And I would say that people seek out the martial arts when they, they feel their child. We have this reputation. People feel like their child needs discipline or they need, uh, you know, X, Y, Z. And certainly, um, you know, all those things can be gotten in martial arts. Uh, usually it has to start at home for sure. Um, and so what happens for us is when we get a whole group of kids sign up for karate, it's everybody. It's across the board. It's athletic kids. It's non-athletic kids. It's uh, children with autism, children with dyslexia, children with uh, bipolar or, or ADHD, uh, kids from kindergarten to high school. And it's very often that we have all those different groups and ages and abilities all in the same classroom. So, um, you know, we teach multi-level classrooms and multiple different types of people uh, every single day, and hopefully they've learned as much from us as we have from them. Yeah, absolutely. I, I learn things from the students that I teach every day, and when I work with kids, I'm constantly, constantly learning from them. And I think sometimes as a teacher, we think that we're doing the ones teaching, but the truth is we should always be learning as well. Now, I know that, Lisa, in order to work with kids with autism, and, um, and obviously you said you work with lots of different kids, but I know that there was a learning curve, and you mentioned that you read a lot of books. So do you have a favorite book regarding autism, regarding that parents can read if they're on the show, or someone's maybe just listening to this, as maybe they own a karate studio, and this kind of caught their attention because they want to specialize or work with kids with special needs. Is there a particular book you could recommend to them? You know, I have an absolute favorite, and it was something that I read probably within the last year, and it just sums things up for me so nicely. And both as a parent and as an instructor, I found that um, this, this book is called Ten Things Every Child with Autism Wishes You Knew. And it's by, 11, uh, sorry, by, 11, by Ellen uh, Notbohm, uh, and it is such a good book. And, you know, the gist of the book is basically, you know, take your child for who they are. Stop trying to make them into something that they're not. Um, but she just has, she's, she's kind of a clinical person in her study, but she's also the mom of a child with autism. And her child is older now, so she really does this really nice job of explaining all the challenges over the different years as they evolved as a family. And oh, it is just, I would recommend it to anybody. In fact, I can never keep a copy on my shelf because I'm always giving it to somebody. <laughs> Yeah, I know exactly how that is. I have a few books like that that, that I often will pass out or go through. Um, none in the field of autism where I would share them on this call, but they, um, one, of the, one of my favorite books is actually The Have It All Woman, which is written by a friend and mentor of mine. And it's just what we were talking about before this, Lisa, trying to balance everything. And you know, like you said, being a mom and having a dog and having a business and trying to get schedules together. And she talks about really how we can have it all. And I actually do recommend that book to anyone who has a child or really anyone, period, because it's just it's so important. Now, one of the things that I know that I get out of a yoga practice, I do a lot with yoga, is I get self-care out of it and really just taking time. You know, what are some of the benefits that children with autism can get from being in yoga? A lot of parents, you know, they may not think their child can do yoga. Um, excuse me, some yoga. I'm saying yoga because... I, that's what I was talking about for me, but from karate, you know, if a parent is thinking, I don't really know if my child can do karate, I don't know for sure, you know, if they're going to get anything out of it, you know, what would you say to that parent? Um, you know, I would say that, you know, first of all, karate is like any sport, and, uh, you know, children are going to be drawn to the things that they're going to be drawn to. So there are a few things that are specific about karate that are, uh, that make it maybe a little bit more likely that a child with autism would be attracted to it. And so a few things are, like, first of all, there's a lot of organization. Um, you know, a soccer field can be extremely chaotic. Uh, there's a lot going on and all these things. When, when somebody comes to the karate dojo, depending on the dojo, of course, but a dojo is oftentimes very neat and orderly. So that feels safe. Uh, the rules and expectations 
expectations are clear. You know, it's very, we're very black and white. If this, then that. If this, then that. And so rules and organization are good for all kids, but certainly if you're trying to figure out where you fit in, a karate dojo can be helpful in that way. Um, we, because in, um, in karate, we have sort of, a, we ourselves have a spectrum of things that we do. And spectrum is such an interesting word. I should think we should talk about that word at some point, but I'm going to come back to karate. Um, so we do very left brain logical things like basics, drilling, and kata. Kata uh, is memorized forms. And then we do very right brain creative things like sparring and free form activities, fun, and like games and things like that. So if you're a real left brain logical person and you want something that you can do over and over and over again and perfect it, karate is a place you'll get rewarded for that activity. So, um, so that's a great benefit, right? However, if um, a child has maybe like text issues or something like that, they may come in, they may not like to have their feet, you know, have bare feet. They may not like the feeling of a karate uniform, uh, you know, if it's crisp on the first day. So if you have a child with autism and you're going to enroll them in a karate class, it might not be a bad idea to, let's say, contact the instructor, get the uniform ahead of time, wash it, dry it, take the tag out, and make it more, you know, more appealing to your child if they, if they tend to have those type of texture issues. Um, what are some other benefits? Those are, I mean, those are some of the major benefits. Does that lead you to any other kind of questions or anything? Yeah, absolutely. Now, first, before I ask you another question, I just want to say that that's really great advice to get there for in advance. A lot of times with children, it's a change just to that at home will make it a whole lot easier. I actually recorded a podcast last year that will be released over the next week um, that I, we talked about going to a restaurant, that even just getting the food and taking it home. So anytime you have a chance to make sure that, you know, a child is, is not experiencing a new activity, you know, everything is new for the first time, the more you can do, I think the better. So that definitely is, is really helpful for parents. Now, I talked about wanting to share this this podcast with some people who own karate studios and you know you gave some great advice to the parents and you know, what would you say to a karate instructor who you know maybe has never worked with kids with autism before or just got a new child in their class and they're listening to this because they want to learn a little bit about you know how to help them is there anything specific you know to karate that they should know about students with autism any things that you've picked up on over the time you've been working with kids that might make it easier for them Absolutely. Um, you know, I think with karate is obviously a very physical thing. And within the realm of sparring and working together, um, it's been my experience that it is not uncommon for a child with autism to have a hypersensitivity to being touched and a hyposensitivity to what they're doing for touch. So what I mean by that is when I'm in a situation where I'm having kids spar with each other, so we're actively punching and kicking and blocking with a partner, um, it has been my experience over and over and over again that a child with autism can, um, and I'm going to put it on a, like a scale of 1 to 10 because uh, that's easier to understand in my mind. So a child with autism might come up and punch me at like an 8, and, you know, I'm a black belt. I can handle that. That's okay. Um, but if I return the exact same, same amount of power, well, first of all, that wouldn't be very nice because I'm bigger than them, right? But if I return what I think is the same amount of power that they're generating, they're going to perceive it like a 12 or a 13. So they are they're hypersensitive to what's coming at them. And, you know, sometimes that can be like they're just their feelings can get hurt also. It might be, it could be words, it could be, it could be that a physical touch. Um, they just are kind of hypersensitive to feeling things. But then when they give it out, when they give a punch or a kick, they are trying their best and they are doing their absolute best in that moment and they're kind of single-minded about it that they almost forget that there's another person on the other side. And I have, I had seen, I saw a young man, he was a teenager, but he, he kicked a fellow student in the face 
and gave him a bloody nose, and now these were advanced students, so it wasn't like a beginner's class. He gave that kid, the other child, a bloody nose and, and had no idea that he had made contact. And that was the first moment that I looked and I went, wait a second, something. How, does, how can he not know that he actually injured the person that he was working with, but he had absolutely no idea? And so over the years, that kind of was like a seed in my mind. And then over the years, I've watched it over and over and over again. And so and with that, with that young man, we made so many mistakes because we, we tried to logic with him and say, no, you don't understand. We're hitting you as hard as you're hitting us. But, but, it, but we were, we were, our perceptions were different. And so um, I, I, I'm sort of sorry that we, we learned in a, in, a, in a negative manner, but now I understand that I have to be very light with somebody and I have to do a better job of reading their body language and I have to do a better job of adjusting my expectations to a place where they can be successful. And then, so that is like one very specific thing. Um, but something else that I've really learned is that um, figurative and metaphors and jokes and things that are not literal or not super clear um, often are impossible for certain people to understand. So I try to have a method where I use m multiple ways of explaining something. For example, I might say, I don't want you to hit quite so hard, but, but using that type of language, a lot of people don't understand that. It's just too vague. So I don't want you to hit quite so hard, Let's imagine you're, we're, we have a volume button right now, and you're hitting at an 8. What I need you to do is I need to turn the volume down to a 4. Now I've quantified it and gave them, I've given them a very concrete thing. Oh, this is an 8. Turning it down. This feels like a 4. And then, and then immediately, as they do that, immediately set in with a compliment. Nice job. Nice job turning that down to a 4. Thank you very much. And confirming to them that they did the right thing in that moment. So those, those, that's kind of an extension of one of the same things, but those are very, very important, especially in a physical, physical activity. And I don't care if you're a soccer coach or a basketball coach or, uh, you know, or whatever, somebody getting emotional doesn't mean that they're wrong. It means that they perceived something that caused them harm, um, even if you don't see it. Sometimes you have to kind of step back and, and have a different view. And those are two really great tips. And so my training is in classical ABA behavior, and those are things we talk about all the time. So when you're talking about, you know, giving them uh, the reward, we talk, or, you know, giving them a compliment, we, we talk about using a reward, using reinforcement, and, you know, definitely those are really helpful strategies. And I had never heard the volume. Uh, I, I've always called it a thermometer, but I, I like that, a volume. I think that for – I'm going to – I'm going to be using that because I think for kids they would relate much more to volume than they would to temperature. So I'm going to start using that in, in place of a temperature gauge for all of my students. So thank Great. you for sharing that. You're welcome. Well, they all have volume on their radios now, right? So. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Where, hey, you know what? Be, I don't think kids even know what a radio is before. You know, it's interesting. I took my car for a car wash, and I haven't turned the radio on in my car, the stereo on in my car, because I just use my phones. I had my headphones. I have a Bluetooth and. I use my headset when I'm driving, listen to some music or a podcast, and I'll put on my directions. And I actually, like, there was, there was music playing in my car, and I couldn't figure out where it was coming from. And I actually <laughs> pulled over, and I was, like, going through my bag, and I have an iPad in there, and, I like, <laughs> the iPad wasn't playing yet. And then, like, I, I, like, literally was, like, looking for a Kindle because, like, one of my – have a Kindle in there, and – and then music wasn't coming from there. Then I, like, <laughs> opened my trunk, and I, like, got my laptop out of my trunk to see if my laptop was playing music. And then I realized that it was coming from the car radio. And, it, so and I, I literally <laughs> didn't, even, I didn't even remember the car had a radio. And I think that's so, you know, using any time we can relate things, and then I think that's an important lesson, right, as well, is relating things to what kids know and and what technology kids are using, but I uh, definitely made myself feel really old. But considering the fact that most of the listeners will probably be listening to this um, on their iPhones while they're doing something or driving or running or, you know, at the gym, so it doesn't make me feel that bad. So everyone, uh, edit, most people who listen to a podcast would probably be late to embracing modern technology and no longer using their car radio. <laughs> 
You know, one of the things that I've learned from teaching, you talk about, you know, learning from this mistake. And I made a lot of mistakes when I first started teaching. And I remember for me, it was really funny because I had a, I, I knew an ABA therapist, and so I was it's very by the book. And when I kind of got a little bit more experienced and got older, number one, ABA has changed a lot. The science of how things are done has improved since I first started in the different behavior technologies we use. They have improved as well. But I also had to learn to be much more flexible. And it was, I was actually observing another therapist. And the, the question was they were teaching a child to respond to what the function of an object is. So the, the therapist was asking, what do you do with a ball? And the answer she was looking for was to throw a ball. And he had said, you kick a ball. And she had like, nope, they throw. You throw a ball. And he's like, you oh, do yeah. kick a ball. And she's like, throws the answer. And I was like, okay, well, I learned from that moment right then and there. And I was kind of laughing because I had actually at the time wrote the curriculum for that therapist to use. I'm like, okay, you know what, being more flexible and I realized, you know, learning from those little mistakes that you make, okay, yeah, you know, breathing room, being more flexible. And, you know, it, as you go and as you work through kids, you learn so much from them. We talked about that earlier. You know, what are some of the mistakes you've made, challenges you've overcome, and really to get to where you are today? Um, one of the immediate things that comes to mind was after reading the 10 things every child with autism wishes you knew, I realized how chaotic a big gymnasium could be and that just talking, sometimes just giving directions to the whole class, um, sometimes it works, you know, because we're very physical, they can see what we're doing. But I noticed we were playing a game and the room, you know, the room had changed and gotten a little bit chaotic. And I really... I went, oh, you know what, I have not paid enough attention to that person's body language. And their body language had, ch had changed, and so all I had to do was go and walk over to this young man and explain the directions to him, which when I was far away and there was so much to be distracted by, he didn't understand the directions. So it was such a simple mistake, but some, such a simple fix was to walk across the floor get right in his face, be the only thing he was focused on, and say, hey, these are the three things you need to know about this game. And then, then his entire body changed. He was able to engage. He was able to play. Um, and, I th and, you know, and actually that games is a, is a, is a really great um, sort of subject because it is very difficult for, it's been my experience, it's very difficult for kids with autism to play games sometimes because the, the winning, the pressure of losing is really stressful for them, you know, because they kind of tend to have this, and, oh, and you know, I'm glad I said that because I tend, I, I, I've taught for so long that I, I um, think in archetypes and, and just the concept of they versus this individual person I think can be a problem for us. We have to remember that people are individuals. Um, However, as a group, sometimes kids with autism um, have a real hard time with games because the winning and the losing is such a difficult thing for them to kind of overcome. If you are somebody who is very rule-based and you understand the rules to be, um, you know, if this, then that, some games are actually tricky uh, that they have variable rules and losing is sometimes for some people, people associate, they will associate losing with being a bad person. And so if I, if I notice that with somebody, I'm like, oh, I have to kind of stick that in their mind and be, oh, no, you know, don't play those types of win-lose games because you're just going to shut this person down. Um, and then one mistake, one of, one of my kids, and, and I didn't realize this until after, um, we were playing a game that I originally named Jump and Duck. And Jump and Duck is a game that we play in karate to help people learn how to not be there. I call it the, the don't be there block, right? So, so my explanation is actually a really good expo explanation and name for the game, but the kids over time had renamed it the Stick of Doom because it's this big, long, padded stick that I swing. They stand in a circle, and I swing the stick around, and they have to jump over it or duck under it. But the kids had renamed it Stick of Doom. So as soon as they see it come out, they all yell, Stick of Doom! 
Well, if you're a child with autism and you take things very literally and this instructor is swinging this stick at your head and then I, I hit him in the toe, like from my perspective, super gently, you know, and then the next week he came up to me and said, I have a problem with you. you. There's somebody in the class is abusing me. And I, and, you know, and I had to really, really kind of hold myself back because I knew he was talking about me. And I just, I just sat and I listened and I waited and explained I wasn't trying to hurt him. And, but it wasn't until months later that I realized when I walked out onto the floor and everybody yelled stick of doom and I was like, no wonder, no wonder why he didn't like that game so much. Jumpin' Duck would have been a much better name, of, name for him. So that was definitely one of my um, more interesting mistakes that I had made. Yeah, you know, it's, kids with autism are very, very literal. I've had um, several kids get really upset for, you know, just like that classic, like, you tell like, hey, break the leg. And they're like, why do you want me to break my leg? And, you know, I can't think of any examples off my head, but I, I have a whole bunch of stories myself of, you know, just you say one thing and, and people, they take you really seriously. So you have to really be mindful of the type of language you're using. It's why you know, really when you're working with kids with autism, you talked about not using jokes, but especially not using sarcasm is really important. Mm, absolutely. Well, thank you so much. I mean, you shared so much value with us today. And I, if I'm ever in Maine, I would love to come up and take a class with you. I took one karate course in my life, and um, I had wanted to do karate. I, my mother wasn't really sold on the idea because I had regularly beat up my little brother the way it was. And I was, but I was obsessed with Power Rangers, so I really wanted to use karate. Um, so I always, my, my, I was always pretending my brother was one of the evil monsters or aliens from uh, Power Rangers. <laughs> so my mom was quite concerned about me um, going into karate. And I remember we had our, my very first spar. And at the time, I believed I, I haven't thought about the story in probably 30 years. At the time, I believed that I beat up a much older, a much older boy. In hindsight, when I was thinking about that uh, in preparation for the call, I think he probably just knew better than to hit back a younger girl. <laughs> but I was doing like I was doing it. It was non-contact, and I probably moved in the wrong direction, or he moved in the wrong direction. But either way, he accidentally kicked me, and I, like, jumped on top of him and started pounding him. And <laughs> the karate instructor had to pull me off. And at the time, my mother told me I was thrown out of karate. I think I probably really wasn't thrown out of karate, but I um, – that was the end of my karate career until now. It's so if I'm how. ever in, yeah, exactly. So, but I've always wanted to actually learn a martial arts. So if I'm ever in Maine, I would love to come check out your studio. And I know a lot of people who are listening to this call, if they're up by you, they might love to check out your studio as well. So how could people find um, more information about your dojo, find more information about you, stay in touch with you if they wanted to? Um, well, like everybody, we're on lots of different social media. We, have a, we do have a website at uh, bkdfitness.com. Uh, the name of our karate school is Bushido Karate Dojo, uh, and so that's what the BKD stands for. We're also on Facebook. Um, we, you know, the classes that we teach, we actually teach at seven different elementary schools in the area. Uh, we're in the Lakes region, and um, we teach... Let me see if I can get this. We teach in Lovell. We teach in Freiburg, Raymond, Paris, Bridgeton, Naples, and Poland. And then our home dojo is in Casco, Maine. And so we have, you know, we have classes for kids and adults, really all ages, three- and four-year-olds. Um, and it's just a pretty exciting, wonderful way to live and a great way to raise my family, my whole, like, you know, we, I think you ta said it at the beginning, but my whole family, everybody's, uh, at least a junior black belt or higher, and um, and we you know we have a great time teaching all types of people every single day. Um, and the, you know the website and Facebook are probably the two easiest ways to to get in touch. Our business phone number is two zero seven six two seven seven one seven zero. If anybody wanted to go the traditional route and pick up the phone and give me a call. Well, thank you so much for sharing all that information as well as just sharing all the value that you added to our audience today. Really, I'm grateful that you came on the show. Well, and I'm so thankful that you asked. It's, um, you know, the different types of things that we do are certainly uh, a passion of ours, and uh, it's exciting to be able to share it and for people to value it. Um, I would say that in the 
education community, very few people would really look to the martial arts instructors in their areas. Um, it's been something I've experienced over time is, is really, I, I'm, and I'll be honest, I'll say it's a lack of respect for what we do. Uh, people in education sometimes think that they know more than, than uh, you know, somebody who's punching and kicking for a living. So sometimes we get a bad rap, uh, but, you know, the, the, the observant instructors, instructors and the professional instructors that I know, oh, my gosh, they care about their students. Uh, and if I was going to recommend to somebody about how to find a dojo that's good for you and for your child, I would say take an hour and invest it because karate can be a lifelong endeavor. Take an hour or three or four and go to the karate or martial arts studios in your area. I really believe that the, the style that you study doesn't matter so much as the instructors that you're put in front of. And so I would go and I would sit and watch a whole class from the warm-up to the activity to the games at the end, and I would observe how the instructors speak to the students. Is it caring and nurturing and inspiring and empowering, or is it overbearing um, and something that you wouldn't feel was positive for your child? So it serves two purposes. You want to find the right, and I'm going to say family, you want to find the right family to be a part of, and you also can give the child an opportunity to really have a good understanding of what to expect when they get to the class. Just like you said before about having, um, you know, like bringing the, ho the food home from the restaurant, well, bring the child to the karate school and let them with no pressure whatsoever, not that they're going to sign up, they're just going to watch. And that can really alleviate a lot of stress. And then you can both make an informed decision on um, if martial arts is the right path for your child or not. Well, you know what, That's, it really sounds like incredible advice. And I, you know, for anyone who would discount any professional and any person who is dedicated their life to an art, whether, you know, it's, uh, whether it's martial arts or whether or not it's a swimming instructor. And I've done interviews with swim instructors. I've done, you know, interviews of people who are chefs and who are really just trained in creating a really great restaurant experience for kids on the spectrum. You know, if, if we want to really help our children, and as, as an educator, as a parent, really, that's what we should be trying to do. It's recognizing all of the greatness and all the people in the community and that we're helping a child as a whole. You know, if we, all we focus on is math and science and reading and writing, an individual is not complete. And the way that I found my passion, you found your passion, you know, we get to help our children that we're working with or if you're, if you're a parent, your child with autism, find their passion too. And there's certainly lessons to be learned in everyone. All right. Well said. Well, thank you again so much for coming on our call tonight. You know, to everyone listening in, we really hope that you enjoyed this call and this podcast. If you did, head over to parenttrainingvideos.com. That's where you can access the, not only the replays of the podcast, but you can also access all of the YouTube videos as well that I create. I put out free parent training videos several times a week, um, just things that come up, questions parents ask. I will make them and I'll answer for you. And if you have any questions that you want me to answer for you as an ABA therapist, as an autism ex behavior expert, just drop a comment onto the recording of this podcast and I will get that question answered for you in a video. So thank you so much again, Lisa, for coming onto the call. I really appreciate you. And I appreciate, again, all the listeners who dialed in tonight. This has been another great episode of Unlock the Code. Unlock the Code is a division of Hope Education Services, one of the world's leading companies where parents can learn about autism online. For even more great content, head over to HopeEducationServices.com today and join our list so we can send you our VIP content and you never miss anything that can help your child succeed. Love our podcast? We would love a five-star rating on iTunes and Podomatic. Thank you for allowing us to help you unlock the code of autism. You are not on this journey alone. Together, we're going to make a great team.